silver retailers are planning to become banks when this happens. It, but it's the way business flows. Like once something doesn't work, once you can't sell silver for dollars anymore because you can't do anything with the dollars. So what are you going to do? You have all this silver and you have people that need it because they need money. So you loan it out. With where everything stands right now, I'd love to get a synopsis of how you see the silver market moving forward as today it's uh, trading $19 and change. We're recording on Tuesday, October 11th. So perhaps we could start there. Uh, how long do I see until the end game happens? I wish I knew the exact answer to that question because then I wouldn't have to worry about anything. Um, but look, some of the things that I'm seeing that I'm focusing on is, look, first of all, physical premiums are now above record highs. They're, the junk premiums are now 42%. When, when, you get, when you get premiums really this high in the physical market, what that's saying is that the spot price is less and less relevant in reality. I mean, it's a, that's, it, if you have to pay a 40% premium to actually get physical stuff, then what's the point of a spot price? The spot price is to set the price of the market so the market knows where to price things. But if the market, if the actual market where these things are being sold is saying, no, I don't like that price, then they'll charge a premium way above and beyond. And uh, so that's, that's what's happening. And um, the other thing that I that I saw that like popped uh, popped into my view, I just uh, the the um, we talk about SLV a lot, right? And SLV has been losing a lot of silver. But then I wanted to look at what about all the rest of the silver funds in the world, Perth Mint, um, Gold Money, Kinesis, or whoever stores silver. Whoever basically stores silver for a certificate to give to somebody to say that they own silver somewhere in the world, whether that's SLV or anything else. Uh, and the, what what amazed me is that that the combined um, the combined storage of all paper silver funds in the world has collapsed 165 million ounces just in 2022 year to date. And the, the closest I think was like 15 or 20 million in 2014 or 2015 when the silver market was really getting hammered. There's nothing close to 165 million, but the question is 165 million ounces. Okay, so where'd it go? Where is it? And, and you look you look in the COMEX, the, their total silver stockpiles are not going up. Yeah, registered's going down, but the eligible plus eligible is stable. Like the, they're not getting any more silver. And you look at the LBMA and it's it's tanked another 45 million or something into, into September and now it's at 847 million. And you look at the chart, it's just like straight down since uh since silver squeeze, basically. So it's not going into the LBMA, it's not going into the COMEX. Where the hell is it going? So <laughs> the, the answer has to be where the premiums are, because where else would it go? I mean, you get you get flows into where the you get the most money. So who's who's paying those premiums? The silver stacker. That that's who's paying them. You know that that's what we want people to do. So all this silver is going out of the paper markets into people's basements or attics or or I don't know some kind of trick tile on their floor or in a safe somewhere. I, good. That's that's has to be where it's going. That's that's the silver lining. I believe there's a silver lining around everyone's house. You know, lead paint, silver lining to save it from a nuclear attack or whatever's going to happen in Russia. I don't know. Everything's going crazy. Although something you mentioned last week, which I thought was interesting and something I've thought about before, is that if we do have this environment where silver is becoming more predominant as money, what that actually looks like. And you talked about some of the bullion dealerships almost becoming like a de facto bank. And I was wondering if you could talk a bit more about that, because you know, when we really do have a, a bigger issue, if it hits the dollar, if it hits these other currencies in a more severe, overt way, mm -hmm. how does that, how do you think that actually goes in terms of how people are tangibly using their silver? Well, you got to put yourself into a world like that. And it's hard to do, but it's, it's a world where nobody wants dollars or they just, it's just not worth them enough. Um, and even if it is for a certain transaction, you have to get rid of it so quickly that you, your, the profit margins that you need to make are so high that it's just not worth it. I mean, it happened It happened in Israel in 1984 that basically people stopped paying the mortgages and banks stopped collecting and stopped sending, you know, threatening letters because what's the point of collecting a few thousand old shekels that are worth, you know, a few cents? So everything just stopped. 
And so then what did people use for money? Well, here they use dollars because the dollar was still stable in 1984. It was pretty strong. So the currency just changed from, from the old shekel to the dollar for a while until, the, until they got the new shekel working based on the dollar and then you know distributed that into everyone's account. Uh, so that, that's what happened. Uh, so what, what would happen in a world where people don't want a dollar? So they're not going to exchange silver for dollars. So then what are all these companies going to do that have all this silver and their business model now is to sell it for dollars, but now dollars don't buy anything. So what are they going to do? It's not like it's not like there's a plan now in place where the silver retailers are planning to become banks when this happens. It, but it's the way business flows. Like once something doesn't work, once you can't sell silver for dollars anymore because you can't do anything with the dollars. So what are you going to do? You have all the silver and you have people that need it because they need money. So you loan it out right, at an interest rate denominated in silver. And that's what a bank is. <laughs> except, you know, banks before 1873, they did the same thing, except they used the silver substitute called a dollar, which happened to be paper and lighter. It, but it's like we're, we're going back into a circle of where we were back in 1873, which is what a reset is. Like, you know, this is like, I guess, tangentially related. We talk about resets, but a reset on on WEF terms or, you know, let's say they introduce a, a central bank digital currency and enslave us all and we have no privacy at all. That wouldn't be a reset. That would be continuation of slavery. A reset, we're going back to where we were before, which was when silver was money. And um, one more thing I want to say about that. I'm, I'm not saying that silver is going to be money directly for that long of a time period. Maybe it will be, but but generally silver is silver is going to be money for that for at least for that emergency time period when gold substitutes no longer work and and nobody trusts them so like then what are you going to do so you're going to go to silver because that divides gold very well and uh so we see every time there's a there's a monetary panic the silver the gold ratio goes 15 to 1 and then silver makes a moonshot and it stays there for a little bit and then central banks kind of get control of the situation again and it goes back down. So this time it will go up. It'll stay there for a little bit longer because the panic's going to take a little longer to sort out. Um, but basically, once you have that fifteen to one ratio, I'd say start spending. You know, we don't we don't stack just to have shiny things in our basement. It's nice, but we want stuff. Well, certainly will be interesting uh, to see what that looks like when it plays out. Um, along those lines, something else that you've commented on. In addition to how we've seen metal coming out of the COMEX and LBMA stockpile, we've also seen the banks increasingly getting net long silver, as well as the open interest dropping in silver quite a bit to the lowest level we've seen in a while. Curious if you had any thoughts on the drop in open interest and what's going on there? Uh, well, the drop in open interest would be that. Um you aren't seeing contracts open up and but you are seeing old positions close so that would be uh, short positions closing so there so a lot of shorts are are, are getting closed um, when open interest goes up you're getting speculators go in and then you have to have a new short on the other side of that so then open interest rises uh, but that means that the short positions are closing out uh, i haven't checked the cot numbers how many how many shorts how many longs are there everything's net long now is that what it is yep are there so bullion banks are net long now. Um, so it hasn't been as low since uh, it looks like, what is this, the five-year chart? This yeah. is, yes, the five-year. Uh, I mean, usually when when open interest is this low, you just, you know, look at the graph. I mean, in, in March 2020, it was uh, we were at what, like $10, $50, $11, and then, uh, and then it went back up again. Uh, so at numbers these low, which this low, which is below March 2020, then the price is going to go up again. Exactly when? You don't know. But the key is you don't want to be in a situation where you're chasing it. You want to be in while it's low, so that when it goes up, you're not, you know, clicking the computer the next day and saying, "Oh my God, silver went up 10 percent. I better get in now." No, you don't want to get in now. You want to get in before that. <laughs> That's the whole point. So uh, it, what does it matter if it takes a week, if it takes a month, uh, if it takes a year? I don't think it's going to take a year, but, you know, we've seen this before. We've seen open interest this low. We've seen what happens before. It's going to happen again. 